Now we enter part two of the crash course. Here you'll see the very information that led me and my family to make profound changes in our lives, where we live, my line of work, even where we get our food. With the background you've received to this point, you are now positioned to understand how the three E's, the economy, energy, and the environment, intersect and seemingly converge on a very narrow window of the future, what I am calling the 20 teens. It's the data in these next parts that leads me to conclude that the next 20 years are going to be completely unlike the last 20 years. A small warning, this material can be shocking. And so we begin part two with debt. We're going to pick up two more key concepts in this section, and one of them is utterly essential, and it's this. Ever-growing debts implicitly assume that the future will be larger than the present. We'll be examining this statement in detail in this chapter. Before we go there, a few definitions are in order. A financial debt is a contractual obligation to repay a specified amount of money at some point in the future. The concept of debt is thoroughly characterized within the legal system so that we can say that a debt is a legal contract providing money today in exchange for repayment in the future. Uh, with interest, of course. Debts come in many forms. Auto loans and mortgage debt are known as secured debts because there's a recoverable asset attached to the debt. Credit card debt is known as unsecured because no specific asset can be directly seized in the event of a default. For you and I, there are only two ways to settle a debt. Pay it off, or default on it. If you have a printing press like the government does, a third option exists. Printing money to pay for the debt. This method is a poorly disguised form of taxation since it forcefully removes value from all existing money and transfers that value to the debt holders. I view it as a form of default, but one that preferentially punishes savers and those least able to bear the impact of inflation. The pure debt obligations of the U.S. government as of April 2008 stand at $9,444,000,000,000 and change. This is only the debt. Once we add in the liabilities of the U.S. government, chiefly Medicare and Social Security, we get a number five to eight times larger than this. We'll be discussing these liabilities in the next chapter, so that's all I'm going to say about them right now. Right now, we are focused simply on debt, and it's enough to know that debt is only part of the whole story. Next, this is a chart of total U.S. debt. That's federal, state, municipal, corporate, and private debts in the red line, compared against total national income in the yellow line. The total debt in the United States now stands at over $48 trillion. That's 48 stacks of $1,000 bills, each of which is 67.9 miles high. If we adjust these debt levels for both population and inflation over time, so that we're comparing apples to apples, we find that in 1952 there was the equivalent of $76,000 in total debt per person, and that today the number is $183,000. At $183,000 per head, this means that today, the average family of four in America is associated with $732,000 of debt. This is a useful way to look at debt because it doesn't really matter if the debt is owed by a government agency or a corporation or an individual, because these are really the debts of our country, and all debts get paid through the actions of people. So examining the debts on a per capita or a household basis gives us a sense of the situation. Can debts forever grow faster than the incomes that service them? No, they cannot. There's a mathematical limit in there somewhere. Am I saying that all debt is bad? No, I'm not. Time for another definition. Debt that can best be described as investment debt provides the opportunity to pay itself back. An example would be a college loan offering the opportunity to earn a higher wage in the future. Another would be a loan to expand the seating at a successful restaurant. In the parlance of bankers, these are examples of self-liquidating debt meaning that the loans boost future revenues and have a means of paying themselves back. But what about loans that are merely consumptive in nature, such as those taken out for a fancier car or for vacations or for more war material? These are called non-self-liquidating debts because they do not generate any additional future revenue. So not all debts are bad. Only too much unproductive borrowing is bad. In the past five years, American debt has grown by more than $16 trillion, and a very large proportion of that has been the non-self-liquidating variety. This has profound implications for the future, because non-self-liquidating loans do not generate future cash flows, 
it means that ordinary income will have to be used to pay off today's consumption. And this will mean less cash for discretionary spending in the future. So what is debt really? Well, debt provides us money to spend today. Perhaps we buy a car and we enjoy that car today. But in the future, loan payments represent money that we do not have then to spend on other items. So we can say that debt represents future consumption taken today. Now, as long as it's my decision to go into debt and the repayments are solely my responsibility, then everything's cool. However, once we consider that our current levels of debt will require the effort of future generations to pay them back, we start to trend into the moral aspect of this story. Is it really proper for one generation to consume well beyond its means and expect the following generations to forego their consumption to pay it all back? That is precisely our current situation, and these charts say as much. I often wonder if my children are going to accept this bargain. I have my doubts.